yourself and come to work right after it. And this is normal? I see that's grounds for termination just not in any other... It was not. Place. They were doing workarounds depending on who the person was. Where would this happen? Well, it was happening here when I first got here 20 years ago. So I could see why the guy relapsed. <laughs> no, y'all are crazy. This, I wouldn't see this happening anywhere else. They'd be fired. So why are you letting it happen? Oh, they're your cousin. Right. Okay. So... When you diagnose, so this is why I have that emphasis about addictive organizations and where addictive organizations are. When stuff becomes normal and it's sick and they just continue it for 800 years, you have to basically learn to habilitate yourself towards recovery, right? So, but we're talking about individuals. So when the client understands what their diagnosis means, not just that they have a sy symptoms. For them, this, the client, like I said last week, is n it's not symptoms, it's what happened to them. How do you make an, a sane adjustment to an insane situation with no training? If that became normal and nobody talked about it, you're going to assume that it's normal. So often we're the first people to tell them, uh, no, that shame and guilt you were feeling, look, it wasn't your fault. <laughs> okay? Now that you know, you can make changes. But the changes are going to be hard because you're going to be hampered by your own guilt. All right, so does the client actualize what the diagnosis means, that is, the, the skill set that needs to be developed? All right, and so then can you guide them through the process of detox, recovery, relapse, recovery, 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 relapse, et cetera? There are certain things that are going to be predictable. So we already know emotionally that guilt is a terrible motivator for recovery. So don't guilt trip them. Ask them instead, what did you learn? Well, another way that didn't work. Or, yeah, okay, but what did you learn specifically? I should have seen that coming. Yes, and you didn't see it coming. Why? Now it looks predictable. So as an example, one of the things you want to do or avoid or become aware of on yourself is um, what are referred to as microaggressions. So part of what happens with the client and what we've been trained to do, do is when only one person is giving the diagnosis and both people don't understand what the diagnosis is, and by the client understanding, in case you didn't get this because I'm underlining it several times, the client has to understand what the diagnosis is beyond the label. It has to be a series of action steps that they can take to cure whatever the disease is. All right, so I have to understand type two diabetes, need to drop the weight, Take my meds, exercise, do all these things that are prescriptive, then eventually I get better or delay bad things happening. And I have to do them every day, every minute of every day, right? The client has to know what bipolar means for them. Yeah, I have mood swings. And yeah, my drug, ha my drug habits have either increased those med mood swings or I've tried to medicate those mood swings. But let's look at what the <laughs> mood is. Let's look at the emotional skill set, emotional literacy. So sometimes they'll have a lot of guilt and shame around the diagnosis. So this uh, framework came out of um, 
the psychological science, uh, basically I think we talked about isms, right? So microaggressions often happen within the therapeutic relationship because we as therapists are socialized to a certain framework. The framework is automatically middle class, whether we are middle class or not. So the client is not middle class, there are things that we can say unconsciously that hurt them. So microaggression. So the, the reason, it's not just race, but the original construct came out of looking at race as a discriminator. So commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights and insults to a target person or group. So again, it's beyond race. I'm just using this because this is one of the things that most happens in a power relationship, okay? The therapist and the client is a power relationship where you have more power than the client. You do. There's no way around that. They come into you for help not the reverse, right? So in that power relationship, you gotta be careful about what you say so that they actually feel better for coming to you than worse, right? So you gotta watch those. So the reason this particular slide has these particular, so not just limited to human encounters, but also environmental nature, for example, uh, office setting that un unintentionally assails his or her racial identity or whatever. So there are micro assaults, micro insults, and micro invalidations. So you want to be careful about, you know, uh, one that I'm often guilty of because I'm urban. I don't just mean black. I'm from a place with a million people more people in my neighborhood than the city of Eugene. More people in my city than in the entire state of Oregon. So my bias is definitely urban. So I often come off, look, God, you're Hicks. Okay, that's a micro invalidation. Your experience is your experience. Should be glad you don't have to worry about falling bullets on the 4th of July. I don't know if they shoot off guns where you live, but places where I live, that's cause for... It's nothing like the sound of an AK at midnight. All right, so addictive and withdrawal. So for example, there was a question about once, uh, is LSD addictive if there's no withdrawal? So anything pleasant can be addicting. And we talked briefly about set and setting last week. So one of the things you want to look at uh, as part of the assessment, and that's why this is in here, with psychedelic drugs like LSD, ecstasy, molly, et cetera, you want to check for psychological or emotional trauma. In 60s parlance, we talked about a did they have a bad trip? Because that could be traumatic and actually cause lasting danger because of the way LSD works. It can amplify trauma and uh, sometimes it can cause trauma or cause you to do things. So the danger isn't necessary from the drug physically killing you, it's what you might do on the drug. So, continuing assessment. So, the client learns what's possible to talk about from what you mentioned in the assessment and the diagnosis. What you bring up. Okay? You teach them what it's possible to talk about from what you gloss over or don't mention or don't probe for. All right, so generic assessments. 
assume whiteness, quote unquote. So whiteness isn't just about race. It's also, there are also certain class assumptions. Who generated the instrument that you're using to measure? So for example, um, I forgot her name, but she's done a piece on poverty because she was multi-generational poor and eventually earned her PhD. And she said most literature on poverty isn't written by people who were poor or ever experienced it. I'm the first person to write about this from the inside. And so therefore there's lots of value judgments in the instruments that they use to measure what poverty is. Like for example, I'm considered middle class as a college professor, but really, if I had, if I got stung by a scorpion in like New Mexico, the anti-venom alone, like this, this actually happened to this woman. She got stung by a scorpion, the anti-venom cost 40 grand a dose and she had two. So if you had an $80,000 medical bill, that would significantly affect your ability to pay it. You're not middle class. Yeah, so I'm middle class by income, but if I had a catastrophic thing happen, that could wipe me out financially. You're only wealthy if it doesn't, an $80,000 medical bill doesn't wipe you out, which doesn't describe anybody in this room, I assume. All right. So generic assessments assume whiteness, which isn't just about race or ethnicity, but in other words, race or discrimination is not an issue. So even if people, even if clients do identify as white, do they identify with the other social norms, middle class, high school, college education, consumer, certain degree of scientific literacy, et cetera, et cetera. Those, that's the assumption of what is normal, okay, within higher education. It's assumed that you know certain things automatically, right? A lot of people don't. So the assessments generally don't mention social class, although you could infer their social class from their education, their occupation, and their income based on the job. So in the assessment, the reason I mention this is because do they understand the terms that you're using at all? Because what we're basically using is Freud's talking cure. Remember, Freud was addicted to cocaine. So even though some of his stuff is useful and valid to the degree that it describes things that people had commonly experienced, there's a certain bias there as to what normal is. And for him, normal was a 19th century middle-class white guy in Germany. So if you're not operating from that worldview, you're not normal from that point of view. You're supposed to conform to that. I don't know. I've never heard that. We'd heard about him in my previous psychology class, but I couldn't find anything else on it. Yeah. I would distrust that particular source unless it's in a book. So generic normal might not be optimal. So you and they, the client, might have to redefine and self-define what normal is more optimally. Also, what this means to um, is that, for example, in the case, remember I was telling you about Kathy, Mike, and Gary. Do you recall that? Okay. You sure? Gary, okay, Pendleton Logger, HIV positive, sex industry, right? What's normal? 
normal coping skills for Pendleton? For your face with death in your 24 is to drink. Not a great coping skill, but often predictable. When faced with death, how do you grieve? You're the possibility you drink. That's your emotional coping skill. So you'd have to redefine, and that's based on a certain code of masculinity. What a man does. How a man ho handles him. So you'd have to refocus and redefine a level of masculinity towards survival and sobriety, right? Because a man can hold his liquor. All right, so redefine it to be non-addictive, emotionally aware, and expressive. All right, and that wouldn't be a value judgment if you were a woman counselor. That would be something, okay, you have to refocus, you have to learn cultural coping skills from outside of the culture that you're in. More of, to be more normal, whatever normal is. So generic normal but might be, again, might not be optimal because it might not recognize the actual conditions that the person came in outside of uh, being middle class, which means there's no survival issues or no active discrimination aimed at you. So, what is your understanding of gender, gender expression, sexual orientation, etc.? As a question, verbal answer. <laughs> well, isn't gender what you're born with, and gender expression is how you feel? And your sexual orientation could be completely different from all, from both of those. Not bad, but you need to put some spin on it. But good. Others? Yeah, going along with her, gender is, you know, are you female, are you male? Gender expression, uh, do you choose to act like a male, do you choose to act like a female? Sexual orientation, are you homosexual, heterosexual, are you bi, are you, it's preferences, or what you define yourself as and how you're going to express your gender. Okay. All right. Anyone else? What you are, what you would like to portray, what you enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Your, 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 your kinks, your sexual... Okay. All right. Okay, so as an example then, <laughs> notice none of your answers are wrong. I want you to notice that, okay? But they are socially defined, and therefore they change. Now, clinically, this results in a conflict with people, all right? So... As I told my work study earlier, who is a self-described, one of them is a self-described redneck. It's like, okay, we won't even get into the origin of where that term comes from. You're letting other, you're white and you're letting other white people put you down because of what your folks did a century ago? Or wh whatever, I don't care. <laughs> but leaving that for a second. He kept using the, I, the, the, the nomenclature preference okay now he said I know that's not the and he said this politically correct term I said okay where did politically correct come from well I don't know liberals okay no the actual history is when China switched from thousands of years of being run by kings and queens and emperors to a communist revolution, the communists basically said, okay, y'all need to be re-educated to, to not deal with royalty, to have everybody be the same. So we are going to re-educate you into what is politically correct. 
because politics is about power and they want to say that, okay, we're all equal even though some are more equal than others. I can assure you that people in the Communist Politburo don't miss, miss meals. And there are star people starving in China, so hey. There are people starving in Marcola too, but different thing. So it's not politically correct. It is the same idea as why you don't call anybody black or African American Negro or colored today. It's a dated term, okay? Because it's not a preference, because preference assumes there's a conscious choice. Nobody makes a conscious choice to be something that everybody refers to as negative. They don't. Now, I'm old enough to remember when we were called Negro and being black was an insult until Malcolm X said, no, we're black from Africa. We should be proud of that. We come from a deeper, older civilization than this place. Claim it. Then Martin got killed. James Brown comes up with, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And we never went back. Forget Negro. Right? So some people, that's not our preference. That is our political orientation and a cultural orientation. Same thing with within the worldview of human sexual diversity. So I'll write that down. Human sexual diversity. Human sexual diversity exists. This is the science. Have I mentioned the intersex yet? No. Okay. Now that we're on this topic, the intersexed Okay? So along a continuum that means a range So along a continuum, there are three to four percent of human births annually, planet-wide. Okay, so about four million people a year are born along this continuum where you have on one end of the continuum two visible sets of functional genitalia. Visible. Male and female. On this end of the continuum and then on this end, one. Okay, which is the majority of folks. And in that continuum, then you have a range of folks. So physically, gender, right, is what, what we consider or what the mainstream considers normal, right? One set of visible genitalia, one or the other, right? Pink or blue. Now, the assignment of pink or blue is socially defined in terms of gender. Ladylike and or man's man. Right? Gender expression is how you express that. So how do you deal with tomboys and how do you deal with guys that are light in their loafers? People feel uncomfortable. They trip. They definitely trip. I had a nephew who basically said, you know, I am six foot five, tall and a black African-American, 
16 years old, and I don't play football, and I don't play basketball, I'm a swimmer. I am into architecture and building architectural models. I'm into science. I'm into writing and poetry and literature and act, acting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And people say that I'm not black. Both I get that both from black and white people. Black people say I'm too white because the way I speak, because he's speaking correct scientific English as befitting a architectural design student. And the white people say, oh, well, you're not really black because black is hip hop and rap and you speak correctly, et cetera, et cetera. So that's his racial or cultural expression, as it were. All right? So we don't feel comfortable when people don't fit a particular socially defined thing. And I'm saying that this has the intersects, this is the anthropological term for them. All right? So. A long continuum, two sets of functional genitalia to either a vestigial one towards the middle or the other end of the continuum, one, which we consider quote unquote normal. But I'm telling you, normal is what happens on a regular basis. And this is predictable. Three to four percent of the planet, three to four million births a year. Going back 200,000 years. Because the genome, this is Homo sapiens, so this, the genome, is, the DNA code has been putting up these folks. All right? So, many cultures older than ours fully incorporate them into their society. So, for example, in Africa, and I'm talking about 1977, when a white anthropologist observed this among this particular tribe. So it must be true. Right. Twelve kinds of marriage. Twelve. Because they had females that could lead combat troops into battle and win against Europeans. You call them the Amazons. So in Benin, yeah, we call them Amaz they call them Amazais go out into battle, bring back two heads of the enemy. You only bring back one, yours is added to your pile. And how uh, Not always. Oh, well, not the African ones. Because they also could bear kids. Or have same-sex relationships. Or, anyway... If Sister Girl could lead combat troops into battle against Europeans and win, are you going to tell her who she can bring to her tent? I don't think so. Would you evolve a social form that would incorporate that human sexual diversity? Oh, yeah. The Osage, here on Turtle Island, seven kinds of genders. Seven. Only two of which we'd recognize as heterosexual. Each one having a sacred and defined role within the society. So this question in America about, oh, same-sex marriage, look, some of us have already answered this question already. Not the two-year-old with nukes and cell phones. Y'all ain't old enough to determine that. Some of us have had this question answered it already before 1492. And women in the military and gay marriage, stop tripping, because that's essentially what you're doing is imposing your religious framework on somebody else, because that's what it is. So would you say when, um, now present, whatever, when um, babies are born with... When babies are born in America, both, I heard... Genitalia, are, don't a lot of the parents and doctors decide which genitalia is more... Actually, what af then, often happens, to answer your question, because I know where you're going with this, because it's... Right. Okay? Right. I heard this on NPR, so it must be true. The doctors basically, if they say, oh, well, this is a girl, they do involuntary sex assignment. I, yeah. Well, they will cut off what they yes. are taking to be an enlarged clitoris yes. and make the make it a, a, a girl. Yes. 
right? Yeah. Because they say, and they even had a joke on the radio that they talked about this, it's easier to make a hole than a pole. Yeah. And then so these so, people yeah. mm -hmm. become adults, mm -hmm. and they're complete. they're... They, they haven't reset the DNA, so exactly. basically what happens is Completely. puberty, DNA is setting what uh, hormones and what your sexual, right. you know, so who a, you're attracted to. So a man will be trapped in this female... And that's how they often describe it. I feel trapped in the wrong body, and I've always known from an early age, and so that's why they say well, it's an... Orientation, not a preference, because it isn't conscious. Yeah. yeah. All right. A uh, three to four percent. Depends on factors. We have nothing. The reason I'm bringing this up, okay? Whatever your religious framework, whatever you want to look at it, we have to go by the science. What the science says, that is, APA and the World Health Organization. Okay, DSM does make reference to gender identity dysphoria. That means you don't feel good about what your gender identity is. All right, and there is talk about DSD, that is disorders of sex development. Not really well worked out. All it is is a category, a diagnosis that we can charge insurance for counseling with. But this is often a driver of substance abuse activity because usually the friendliest place that they can find is a gay bar and if they aren't of age why are we socializing gay teens and gay and lesbian teens to go to a bar for help so often they kill themselves at rates higher than the general population because a significant part of teen suicide, something like 28 to 30 percent, are around gender issues. Well, there's a there's a individual working at a Walmart locally. Yeah. His insurance, what he sex reassignment he, surgery, yeah, right? Did not right. cover right. his insurance wouldn't cover it, so right. he went home, got plowed, and cut it off, and went to the emergency room, and they did the procedure for him. One way of handling that, not yes, recommended. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. So, www.dsdguidelines.org, www.dsiguidelines, uh, we're basically in terms of parents with photos, etc., etc. So, the idea here, you know, theoretically, you might have to do and you do some lobbying with your agency for inclusion, but you shouldn't have to because inclusion of diversity is part of the Oregon administrative rules within treatment. So I'm just giving you a framework to look at. Look, you have to understand what your biases are going into this and where they came from. All right. I have no problem with people's religious orientation. You know, you can make a stand one way on gay marriage or not. That doesn't matter. According to the science, this is the science. This is what's happening. So deal with it. Okay? The same religious framework basically said that black people were not human. We were cursed by God, that's why we were black. Oh, same religious framework didn't allow us to marry heterosexually. Same religious framework wouldn't allow us to marry white people. Same version of the Bible. Were they right or wrong? So they're wrong about race. What else might they be wrong about? So again, it's about the science. So me, politically, it's like, I, ain't gonna, I don't think Angela Davis is less black because she's lesbian. In fact, I, I dare you to say that to her face. I'll deck you for her. Okay, they've been an integral part of my people's civil rights struggle, so I'm down with them. Any framework that allows people to understand and help people, that's what we're here to train for. All right, similarly with issues of race, DSM doesn't deal with that at all. So if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen, therefore it won't be referenced in treatment. So this needs to be written down as part of your assessment. 
whether it's in the assessment form or not, generally, you, if you get to the position where you can rewrite the assessment form to include these kind of questions, you can apply the correct framework. And the correct framework is the one that leads to sobriety based on their, the problems that they refer to. All right? So some agencies will separate who does intake from who does face-to-face -face treatment. Um, I've done intakes on people that I later uh, had one-on-one uh, -on -one and group um, therapy with. So, okay, it has happened. So at assessment, you should be aware and make the client aware of what's ahead and prepare them for it. So after assessment, you may become aware or the client may reveal other core issues uh, core issues they've been self-medicating. So you obviously can't do intake while they're loaded, but you can do it while they're in a stage of readiness for treatment. You're preparing them to be successful, so be real with them. Don't minimize the danger, but do emphasize their strengths and let them know about predictable pitfalls, if you know them. So both in themselves and particularly in society. So, the smarter they are, the more they could be their own worst enemy, like Charlie Sheen. So intellectuals are often more disconnected from their feelings and will use anger displays and grandiosity to distract you, like war stories. Amazing dope tales. So in society, <clears throat> Common practices and structures produce addicts while preventing effective treatment or any treatment from getting to people. So, for example, military, the prison industrial complex, the entertainment industry, culinary industry, to name a few. So, for example, the prison industrial complex, that's what the pick is, needs active addicts. The military entertainment tolerates addicts and alcoholics as long as you do your job or don't become a PR problem. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> A.K.A. Lindsay Lohan, right. <laughs> so in either case, greater trauma needs to be met with greater skills of introspection and action for change. So last week I actually talked about uh, three eyes on the board. I found uh, the slide sets that actually talk about it, which we won't be able to deal with in two minutes. But... Uh, the eye of flesh, the eye of mind, the eye of contemplation. And so these are three different modes of uh, perception that you can use within uh, an assessment and diagnostic framework. So as an example, just going through this quickly, this is why may I bay in Oahu. So I'm using that the idea is that emotions are like ocean, they're like water. And they're different stages of water, right? So this is Waimea on a flat day. Now this is actually a big wave surfing place. So this is on a flat day. That's slightly bigger. So you can note these guys are standing up. You can tell the wave height relative to them. A little bigger. Then board surfing. Then that's a 60 foot wave. Same beach. So the point being, for some reason, PC is not replicating these slides, these pictures. Perhaps your computer will. So anyway, the idea is that there are certain things that you do when faced with a wave like this that's, in terms of scary, that's relatable to the treatment process in terms of dealing with emotions. You give them a skill set to deal with the things that are predictably going to come up with. And it's like surfing. So, see you Thursday. Papers are in there.